am looking to engage you. So please don't wait to be invited to ask questions or participate. Just wade in. Uh, if you disagree or vehemently agree or would like to ask questions of elaboration, I'm very, very welcome, uh, welcoming of such interventions. Um, and, and frankly, if you don't involve yourself, I will involve you. And, and that frequently gets messy. So I'd, I'd encourage active participation. I really could. And for those of you who aren't in the room and are, are picking us up remotely again, please do jump in. You know, as you've already been invited, please either put a comment or a question into the chat box. Or if, if you want to appear on a screen and you're able to um, make your voice heard, it would be really welcome. I will become very boring after about half an hour if you just let me talk. So, so get stuck in. Any questions before I start then? Good. OK, so uh, the, the, the presentation is entitled The Truth About Benefits Realisation. Um, and of course, this is a critical subject. Um, the, the entire rationale for running a change initiative is to achieve some general beneficial change. Um, but it's an ill-understood discipline, many organisations, and very poorly practised by most. It's not clear why that's the case, whether sponsors and, and funding authorities are trying to duck their responsibilities, or whether the project community are just oblivious to the need to secure benefits. It's generally poorly attended to. So what I'm going to do over the course of the next hour or two, and um, depending on how many questions you've got and how much fun we have doing this, is start delving into, first of all, the definition of benefits, but then more importantly, how they come about, how we actually get to realise benefits, and what tools and techniques should we be employing in that arena. Um, and I expect that'll um, take most of the evening, as it were, that, that how do you actually make benefits happen? Um, I think that's enough positioning, really. If you're sitting comfortably, we'll begin. So I'd like to start really by, by a definition of benefits, because the word benefits is, is bandied around all the time. And it doesn't matter whose body of knowledge you read, there seems to be no consistent solid definition of what a benefit is. You know, if you go and look at the, the manuals, it'll say it is a, a, a positive change. Well, well, yes, it is a positive change, but, but becoming happy is a positive change. Yeah. Does, does that add value to anything? And the concept of benefits obviously hinges on the concept of value. So I'm going to just set a, a ground rule that for the purposes of this evening's discussion, whether you carry this forward or not is, is up to you. A benefit will be defined as a measurable addition of value. That is, you know you've attained a benefit because you are better off. OK, you have not maintained the status quo. Now, that's quite an important distinction, because much of the work we do is to maintain a status quo. We cannot have a benefit if we're maintaining a current position, but it's worth maintaining a current position, avoid a market becoming eroded, to, to fall into a, a bare pit of um, legal liabilities and so on. It is necessary at times to run change initiatives just to maintain a status quo. That is not a benefit. You are not better off as a result of doing it. In fact, you're worse off because you spent some money to stay where you are. Benefits mean that you've spent some money to make your position measurably better. We all come for you with that, because I mean, I, I'm liking the odd nod here, but it's, it's okay. Not happy, not Why? happy. Why not? Because there are just benefits, and these are taking place. And without spending money to avoid the disbenefits, uh, you end up in a worse position. But, but a disbenefit, is, is presumably the antithesis of a benefit. But not in a... If by definition, it isn't a benefit, it's a disbenefit. It's a cost. It's, it's a, mm -hmm. a, a, a money foregone. Oh, well, money foregone to maintain the current mission. Oh, absolutely. And I'm not saying that's not valuable to do, but it's not value-adding. The cost of bringing things up to... Yeah, we, will, uh, we will address this as we go forward, but I'm very happy to have a discussion about the disbenefits when we hit that particular debate, because we're going to hit that in about five minutes' time. So there we are. I'm going to maintain that benefits, not disbenefits, benefits themselves are a measurable addition of value. And that doesn't necessarily mean money. Quite clearly, lots of organisations have no concept of money as a value system. Charities, for example, don't, don't value money. If you give them money, They'll spend it as quickly as they possibly can on something they do genuinely value. So value does not equate directly or necessarily to money, but it is measurable and must be measurable. It must be measurable even when in the old parlance it's intangible. Now, you've all seen in your experience projects that are claiming intangible benefits. 
And very often it's the sponsor's shorthand for, I'm not going to be held to account for this because you're not going to be able to prove I've achieved it or not, because it's not measurable. That is not a benefit. It must be demonstrable. It doesn't have to be demonstrable in cash terms, but it must be demonstrable against some objective measure. And this is me laying the law down, you see, and there's the other person <laughs> bridling already, which is absolutely fine. You know, if you're comfy, I'm going to soldier on at this point. So even if they're not financial benefits, they're intangible in the old parlance, they must still be measurable. And, and from the perspective from which I'm coming, and you may well have your own organisers, there are only eight sources of benefit. You can only achieve benefit in, in one of eight ways or a combination of any number of those eight different ways. Um, so, so those are the ground rules that I'm laying down. We're not discussing benefits as um, non-value adding. We're not discussing them as unmeasurable entities. We will have a discussion about this benefits and costs and how you might distinguish between them. Exactly. But, but that's my ground rules. Anybody want to argue? I just have one comment. Please. Um, what about unplanned benefits? Happy accidents. And then perhaps those may benefit, may not benefit the target audience. So you have a benefit, but it's not, it wasn't your desired outcome. And, and I'm, I'm very happy to countenance that can happen. Mm. Um, and whether your company wants to, or, or whoever's sponsored the work wants to uh, accept those as benefits, or they're just a, a, a coincidental side effect, it's entirely up to the sponsoring authority. But one of the reasons we want to understand benefits quite clearly is they are the justification for an investment in the first instance. Now, you know, if you don't realise the benefit you've claimed for an investment, but it, re it, it realises some ancillary benefits... Should we claim the business case as success or a failure? If you haven't tapped on the desired audience, then surely it's not successful. Well, the, ha the happy audience is going to be pleased, aren't they? They'll review it as a success, but yes, I'm with you. If it is a rationale for an investment, the company must receive the value that they've invested in, not an ancillary value for somebody else. I mean, I, I, I had a perfect example of this. I was um, reviewing a, a, a project of a couple of years back now, admittedly, where... The, the organization in question was hemorrhaging money. It was a retail organization. It suffered a problem called GLIT, goods lost in transit. And, and this represented about 40% of their profit going west each year, millions of pounds of goods lost in transit. So they, they invoked an IT project. And this IT project was going to stop goods getting lost in, in transit because they were going to introduce handheld barcode scanners throughout their logistics chain. Okay, Can anybody see a flaw in this argument? Scan. No, 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 everybody happily scanned. In fact, the triumph was the, the project was hailed as a triumphant success because they introduced these scanners to time, cost, and quality. They functioned perfectly. And guess what happened to goods lost in transit? They've gone down. Why should they have gone down? You've got better control of where they are. No, you know where they are at any point in time because you've got your handheld scanner, but what's causing them to go missing? They were still stolen. Well, if that were amongst the coordinates. <laughs> Yes, some light fingered scallywags could still steal the contents of a package, you scan it. You know where they are, they're not lost. Well, definitionally they're not lost, but you see, we've got this glit, it's actually a euphemism, isn't it? Or it's, it's, a, it's an acronym for a whole world of things. What causes goods to get lost in transit, apart from larceny? <laughs> you can't they scan them if they're not there, can you? Well, you can certainly scan the package. Whether it's full or not, you can't tell from barcode scanner reading. Yeah. Mm. So theft was certainly amongst the causal factors, but so too are handling errors. You know, the fact that Bert sticks a pallet of goods in the wrong bay, um, well, they're lost. And a barcode scanner tells you Bert had them, but, but thereafter the trail stops. It doesn't stop the things getting lost, does it? Yeah, what about if in the cause of handling due to laziness? Yes, it could be human error, process error, yeah, just, just sloppiness. And, and your handheld barcode scanner might tell you the last time you saw the goods, but it doesn't stop them getting lost. Yeah. So, so, you know, it was a failure. Glit did not move. The benefits, the expected millions of pounds of savings in, in, in lost goods wasn't realised. But the company developed some really interesting MI yeah. on customer buying patterns. And, and, and ordering patterns and manufacturer supply statistics and all sorts of really good statistics. So guess what the sponsor claimed? Success. Claimed success. Triumphant success. But all, but all you've actually got is a recovery point objective because you didn't know the last time the goods were seen. So between this, unless you're constantly measuring them between this point and this point, they fell off the boat. 
But Absolutely. Sure metaphor, but they got happy, happy accident. It, it, it was actually more generally the back of a lorry, but but the happy accident you refer to, the happy accident you refer to was actually beneficial to the company. They they could actually improve their logistic processes, their, their ordering processes, and their sales procedures and, and target their audience more precisely because of the statistics they've raised. But that had never been the planned benefit. The planned benefit was reduction in, in the cost of goods lost, which significantly outweighed, obviously, the, the uh, data privilege they've got from running a project. I think if I was the COO in a large company, I'd probably claim victory at that point. Well, that's so exactly a moral victory. If, not... I, if I was the large CIO, I'd rapidly update the business case. <laughs> yeah. What are your guys to do it for you? You're right. You know the flaws in the system. Yeah, and this is right, mate. Of course we have that now. I, I, I appreciate this is a flippant comment, but this is this this really is underpinning this this discussion we're having because Benefits need to be taken seriously, and, and if we're aiming to reduce glit, we must reduce <coughs> glit, not produce some rogue MI about how customers are buying stuff. Now, I, I tell the story partly because the, the, the after effect was quite interesting. You know, given that glit represents about 40% of the annual profit, and they failed to address it. This company actually, 18 months after having run this successful project that produced the MI, went to the wall and was bought by a French competitor. <laughs> This, this is you, you have um, the expected benefits, but if the benefits, um, the definition for the benefits are questionable. I think you're absolutely right. Cool. So if it's not, if, if it's not properly defined, in other words, if it's not maybe smart enough, then um, there's no way you're going to reach it. And if by chance you just have this in incidental benefits, then it makes a nonsense of the whole Yes, I, I agree with you entirely. And and in my in my liberal and soft and democratic manner, I really would like to hold the sponsors' feet to the fire for the benefits that they've claimed they're going to achieve. Because that's what the money's being spent on. It's not being spent, sorry to say to the British Computer Society, on the kit. I mean, clearly there is some cost of the kit, but the only justification for that cost is the return of the benefits. And I think you're absolutely at the heart of it. Those need to be clearly and precisely defined up front. This is the reward we're expecting, and they must be measurable per my definition. They must be a measurable addition of value. Now, because I want them that clearly and precisely defined, I'd like to move on to doing a little bit of definition. I've boldly declared there are eight sources, so um, I'm going to put some meat on those bones. And, and those eight sources of, of benefit um, will group into two categories that we're going to unpick. But the other thing I do want to spend a couple of moments on, and thank you to the, the gentleman at the back of the room, is the difference between something being value adding and something being valuable. And, and a lot of people would say, there's a smart, not necessarily smart, there's a consultant standing at the front of the room trying to trick us with semantics about things. But it's not like that. If benefits are about a measurable addition of value, the company is on the balance sheet, at the end of the day, better off for having achieved benefits. If it avoids disbenefits, what happens to the balance sheet? It stays the same. In fact, it reduces by the cost of the initiative that's, that's delivered that security from disbenefits. And that's why I think it's worth distinguishing between, between the two. The accountant will have said we were due to lot of accounting will do something smart in the notes, won't they? Saying we were due to lose this and we did this, blah blah blah. So we're back at zero. <laughs> well, uh, I haven't got the time for accountants, but I, I've got that impression, Nigel. And we might have common ground here. I've, some of my best friends are accountants, <laughs> There we go. Um, we need a job when necessary. So it is important that we distinguish between value adding and valuable because. Many, many projects, I'm not going to venture that it's a majority, but it certainly is a significant number, are valuable without <laughs> being value adding. You know, complying, you know, we're, we're sitting on the edge of the city. Financial compliance is hideously expensive, but it is a necessary evil for those companies. It is valuable to them because it allows them to continue to trade at significant cost, but they're not making any extra return on it. So they're not making any benefit from it in these definitional terms. They are avoiding what we might term a disbenefit. 
So uh, I, I want to talk about the two camps into which for me benefits fall. The first one is, is straightforward. It's the financial camp. That is monetary benefits. And, and a lot of organisations and certainly commercial enterprises think the financial benefits are the be all and end all of, of a benefits case. Uh, and conveniently being eight categories, there are four in each camp. So financial benefits come in the form of cost avoidance. That is, we have a known and or committed cost that we expect to spend. And if we can reduce that, the saving we make will appear on the P&L and drop into the balance sheet at the end of the year. So we are better off. That is not the same as avoiding a fine. A fine is a risk event, which you may or may not get hit with. And if you do, it will come straight out of your P&L, the reflector into the balance sheet at the end of the year. But if it doesn't, what will happen to your balance sheet? Nothing. It stays the same. So avoiding risk is not the same as cost avoidance. Cost avoidance is actually reducing your expected or anticipated costs. So altering your supplier potentially because they're providing the same kit at the lower price or, or that type of approach. The second source of, of um, financial benefit is achieving additional income. And additional income is, well, exactly what it says on the tin. This is we are selling more of the products and services that we already have or selling more to the customers that we already caught. If, if a sales team is challenged with increasing the amount of revenue they generate, where will they go to first? Price. They can try and uh, they can try and hike the price up. Well, well, they'll drop the price. If they want to raise revenue, they'll drop the price to get more customers. Yeah, they might well do that as long as they don't throw the margins too well. That might very well help. Yeah. But um, the, um, sorry to interrupt. They can increase the the quantity. Oh, the, the quality increase the quantity. Yes, they could increase the quality of their selling proposition. Yeah. Or they could increase the number of sales visits they make, both of which will presumably increase sales. But are they going to do that to known and existing customers? Or yeah, are they going farm. to do that to new prospects and, and cold they customers? farm as much as they can. They will farm rather, farm rather than hunt. Farm rather than hunt. Why will they farm rather than hunt? Much more likely to just... History shows loyal, the loyalty effect yeah. and all that. But because your customers are already buying more, from you. And it costs you less to farm than to hunt. They are more certain of doing business. So it is a lower risk approach. But with low risk comes relatively low rewards. But approaching a known entity who already does business with you and cross-selling or upselling or playing with the prices is, is a good place to go as a first instance because it's a low risk approach. New income, on the other hand, it's not such a low risk approach because this is either selling new products or services, i.e. they haven't been tested and trusted in the market, so we don't know that they're going to sell, or it's finding new customers. And you've got to seduce them into trusting you and believing in you and altering their suppliers and all sorts of other stuff before you can actually secure a sale. So it's a much higher risk approach to getting additional money in than, than looking for additional income, which again is a higher risk approach than looking for cost avoidance. So there's a, an ascending scale of risk to these approaches. And of course, for the rural business, there's a direct correlation between that ascending level of risk and the expected level of reward. It's kind of new business is more profitable than repeat business. Repeat business are expecting good accounts and, and so forth. Hey, Nick, does, yeah. does the logic hold then that in the same way that a risk can't really be counted here, uh, an unanticipated uh, income source? can't be and uh, can't be included either you, you wander me into the moral maze <laughs> you're welcome this, thank you thank you so much this, this is the question addressed earlier in the room of a, a happy accident if the happy accident is in the area you'd anticipated achieving benefits you'd have to have the virtue of a saint not to be tempted to claim them and, and I'm not here to, to, to guide you through that moral maze. I think if you've anticipated an increase in income and you achieve more than you expected to, you chalk it down to good luck. But I wouldn't claim it was superb management. And, and this is a subject worthy of some discussion. We may not have time this evening, but if you project an estimated set of benefits and you get lucky and double your, your, your expected benefits and, and claim them, what's the downside? What's the double edge on that sword? I'll claim them again. 
Yeah. It's not that you can't claim in the game, probably not, but if you are going to say, I will happily take take the, uh, the benefits that I haven't earned, A, you disenfranchise the person who did earn those benefits, uh, and B, you've got no moral ground to stand on when you short, fall short of your benefits. If you've projected £2 million of benefits and £1.5 million comes in, and the world and his wife will be trying to claim those benefits, you've got to have the moral conviction to say, no, I earned these, and this is how we did it. This will be a theme later on this evening when we're, when we're looking at how you actually realise benefits. You must project what you're going to get. And if you get more than that, that's it's good for the company, but it's poor management, isn't it? Because it was just a happy accident. So I don't know if that answers your question appropriately. I can't see you, whether the penny's dropped or not. Uh, yeah, I think I'm comfortable with that. Great. Thank you very much indeed. So the last category of financial benefit is asset enhancement. Uh, and and this is a rare category and, and quite risky because you've actually got to sell the asset to realize the enhancement in cash terms. So asset enhancement is, is a situation whereby you spend an amount of money on an asset to improve its condition, and the improvement in its condition adds value beyond the cost of its improvement. The differential between the cost invested and the asset's current value is asset enhancement. That's additional money you've made on that asset. But clearly, you don't realize that you don't get the cash unless you sell the asset. So a good example of that in, in today's environment, uh, uh, National Grid. So National Grid obviously own a fair amount of real estate dotted about the UK, covered in transformers and power stations and substations. Um, but because technology advances and reduces the footprint of that technology, their sites are bigger than they need. And of course, many of these sites sit in very attractive targets like large cities and towns. And, and make really good real estate proposition for developers. So there's there's an active market for National Grid to downsize the footprint of their campus because technology enables them to, and release the the the, the land that they thereby um, made redundant. The problem with the land they make redundant is it's saturated with cooling oil. So it's definitely a brownfield site before the developer starts. Now that faces you with a dilemma because either you clean up the brownfield site and sell it as a greenfield site, or you let the developer do that. If the cost of cleaning it up is less than the money you will realise from cleaning to, uh, from selling a greenfield site, it's a bit of a no-brainer. You clean it up. That's asset enhancement. But again, I repeat, it's only as you sell the asset that you get to realise it. And it's highly risky because it's a speculative development. The asset may not be worth what you've estimated at the point at which you get round to selling it. Depends on market conditions and so forth. These are the only four sources of financial benefit. I mean, if you can dream up another, please share it with me because you can probably come with a partner at CITI and make a fortune of it. We've been trying for ages to find more. Okay. So if we're going to discuss financial benefits any further this evening, you, we must be able to clearly pigeonhole it into one of these four categories. That moves us on to strategic benefits. Everybody happy? I mean, you've all gone very quiet again. <laughs> when I say happy, I'm using the term loosely, obviously. OK, good. So let's move on to strategic benefits then, and what used to be called intangible benefits. And these are where we are investing our money for a reward that can't be measured in financial terms or can't meaningfully be measured in financial terms. Uh, and the first of these is strategic alignment. A company strategy sets down its future direction. And one of the many functions it serves is to explain how they will invest their disposable income what it's worth spending your money on, because that's the strategic future. If we think miniaturization is it, we're going to spend a lot of resource and project and change management effort on miniaturizing the organization and its outputs. That's, that's the strategy leads the value system of an organization because it allows them to determine their investment patterns. Okay, so strategic value is is what we spend a lot of money on. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to turn to National Grid because it's a, a fairly good example of this. Per most large organisations dealing in capital delivery in dangerous environments like uh, national infrastructure, you know, gas mains, if they go pop, would be very embarrassing, and electric systems, that if they fail, jar the whole nation. They, they are extremely safety conscious. Now, there is an H&S mandate, obviously, a legal obligation for all companies to trade compliant with health and safety law and standards, and, and all companies do that. How do they go about doing that? Not national grid. How do all companies go about staying within the law of health and safety standards? Compliance projects. 
they have a few compliance projects. They'll, they'll appoint a health and safety expert. They'll appoint people to do various different roles that are mandated by a health and safety executive. Is this a willing spend? Will they spend more than is necessary on this stuff? What's the basic philosophy behind the spend on this? Minimum as possible. You spend as little as you possibly can and get away with it. As long as you're safe from prosecution, you're good to go. This is not the case for National Grid. Because they play with such dangerous kit and because they value their reputation for safety, they will invest far more than the health and safety executive would ever mandate in making sure they are uber safe. They have a motto, everybody home safe every day. And they invest millions of pounds in doing that. Why? Because of their reputation, perhaps. Might be to do with their reputation. There's certainly a reputational component of it, absolutely. You're giving yourself a problem down the line. The answer is because they fundamentally at heart believe that is the right way to behave. Make sure your staff cannot be hurt. Not, not to a legal obligation, but a moral obligation. And they are prepared to invest significantly more than they will ever financially earn ensuring that position is maintained. It is part of their strategy. It's part of their core value system. So they're aligning their values to the benefits. Exactly. And the strategy of an organization declares its value system. It's, it's, it's as straightforward as that. And their value system hinges on safety. So do this network rails. And they will hemorrhage cash to ensure they increase that strategic value. And that's not a normal behaviour. If you look at people who work on the road systems, they've got a fairly cavalier attitude to all the health and safety of their operatives, which is why, you know, sadly, several die each year on the roads. This just doesn't happen in, in those national utilities. So strategic alignment is where you are investing to improve a strategic position. And it's not necessarily health and safety, obviously. And, and you can quite transparently see it for most companies. You know, we, we know that Apple actually values... Well, what does Apple value? The customer. the customer experience. Absolutely core to the way they behave. Yeah. Innovation. Absolutely core. You can see it amongst the strategic values. You don't even have to look at their declared strategy. You know that's what they're spending money and effort on. And you can see this for all other companies as well. So strategic alignment is the pursuit of those sorts of values and goals within the company. And that's worth spending your cash on, even if you're not getting a direct financial return. Of course, somebody would argue, oh, the only reason that, that, that Apple actually value their customers and the customer experience is so that they can exploit it commercially and make more profit. But there's no direct attribution of that additional profit to, profit to the money they spend on in, increasing customer happiness. But the real litmus test is, do they actually measure and test customer happiness? And yes, they jolly well do. Yeah, they, they measure the customer experience assiduously and all the time, again, at significant cost. The rest of I suppose they get a bit of advantage from that, don't they? They're, they're creating clear blue water between them and the next in line. Fantastic. And, yeah, well, and, and thank you for this competitive advantage. One of the things you interestingly point out is that these strategies are minglable, that they can be combined yeah? um, and they can support one another. The same is also true of... of, of um, the financial sources of benefit, you can seek additional income and new income on a new product launch if you wish to. You know, you're going to sell it to your existing customers, but new customers as well. It's not as though they're mutually exclusive categories. We just need to know which categories we're actually gunning. And yes, absolutely. Um, the, the idea of competitive response and competitive advantage, I think possibly the wrong way around. A competitive advantage is the interesting one. Because why would a company want to seek competitive advantage? Why does one company want to be better than all the other people in its market? No matter what, make a difference. In what sense make a difference? To be unique. Why do they want to be unique? To make money, surely. To make but if it's to make money, they're not after competitive advantage. What are they after? Make their own. Okay, sure. They're either after additional income, income. or new income. It's a, it's a monetary argument. As soon as you say it's purely a financial driver, it's a monetary argument. Without competitive advantage, you're unlikely to get yeah. that. Look at the supermarkets, the top two. I know nowadays Aldi and uh, Little have probably blown this out of the water. But back in the day, the top two supermarkets had about 60 percent or something ridiculous of the entire supermarket. I think it was Tesco and Sainsbury's. And yeah, so I think it was back then. Yeah. But, uh, I'm not up to date with the figures, so I'm no, sorry, and, and, an old example. And, and nor am I, despite despite standing here flapping my gums about this stuff. They, 
there's something more interesting here, I think. And yes, of course, Apple are to make money. I'm, I'm certainly not going to argue that because they're pretty damn good at it. But the thing with competitive advantage is if you have competitive advantage, what are you actually doing in your marketplace? You're leading in your You're leading it. And then you encourage more investment. You, you might be there to try and encourage more investment, but that isn't additional income. People investing in your company is not additional income because... It, it is it is additional money coming to your organization. You get an additional liability along with that. You've got to pay for the shares yeah. in the sense of it's not free money investment in your organization. With Apple, you'll get brand loyalty. I mean, you'll get people who will stay with you because you are the best. You are absolutely right. But here's the thing. Are they trying to be a market leader to generate that brand loyalty, an outcome that leads to the benefit of additional long term income? Or are they doing it for a different reason? Now, you're quite right. If you are leading the market, what advantage does it give you to be the market leader? You can make the rules. Sorry? You can make the rules. You make the rules. You decide where we're going. Steve Jobs gets to stand up and say, Look, you've never seen anything like this before. It's got one button and it's called a telephone that's a computer. Ha <laughs> ha. Now, Guess what? HTC and Samsung and, and IBM and, and everybody else was saying about that. Oh, sod. We've missed a trick here, haven't we? And what are they going to spend the next six months doing? Trying to catch up. Trying to catch up. And guess what Steve's doing whilst they're trying to catch up? Getting up to the next piece of mischief. Well, it's worse yeah. than that, isn't it? Because if you look at Amazon and Google and Microsoft, no one else will get into the massive cloud provision. Fujitsu tried it, tanked. No one else will get in. They're so far ahead now that the amount of money you'd have to invest to catch up with them, it can't be done. Well, well, maybe some lunatic like Musk. Don't raise your hand, just jump in. <laughs> yeah. um, you're right with what you said, but don't forget that when you when they when any company wants to get ahead of them, they buy them off. Well, I mean, it does confer all sorts of advantages. But yeah. the fact that you're a market leader means you set the direction of the market and you set that direction of market to flatter your skill sets, yes. your staff capability and your research and development. You know, that's 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 just good thinking. The downside, of course, which is it's hideously expensive. Yeah. You've got to buy the best brains and you've got to invest in developing products that you don't know whether they'll fly or not. And you're there to be shot at. And, and you're there to be shot at. Now, it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Clearly, several organizations think that's a really compelling reason for investing. But take the alternative view, that of a competitive responder. Now, if, if we're talking about Apple, in the same breath, let's start talking about HTC. What's their basic strategy? Faster, cheaper. Be cheaper. Yes. Offer, basically, the rules of the game are, wait until Apple launches something, zip down the Dixons and buy a copy of it, Put the back off, see how many patents you don't have to infringe and bang out a clone as quickly as you can. And, and what's the really important part of that equation? Well, get with that uh, competitive response. They don't have to invest in research and development. They don't have to spend a lot of money on research and development. They don't have to spend any money on market testing. Mm -hmm. They have to spend very little on, on advertising and warming the market up because everybody knows HTC is going to have the Apple equivalent three months later and at half the cost. And they'll probably have ironed out most of the glitches Apple left you with, so probably a good buy. Yeah. But what have they got to be? Fast. They've got to be fast. If they can't close the door down on, on any market leader's product very quickly, they lose their commercial position entirely. That's why they say that's why they always buy people off because they want to get their edge ahead. And sorry, I missed that. No, I said that's why they always buy people off because they don't want them to get an edge of them. Yes, I'm, I'm quite sure that's the case. But you can see that these different strategies uh, are worth financing and pursuing in different ways. If you're a market leader, you've got to be at the leading edge, the bleeding edge, developing stuff and launching on the market. And you've got to have a reasonably high success rate with that, which means you need really high grade talent. If you decide you're going to be a competitive responder, just refine your processes to, to clone products very quickly and get them into the marketplace cheaply. Because you don't you you don't need to command the profits that Apple has to command to fund being a, a competitive advantage player. They they can quite happily fund half the cost to produce a like for like product at a, a fraction. So uh, th those are 
competitive response and competitive advantages. The last category of strategic benefit is, is intellectual property. Um, and you know, probably because we're a consultancy, we use those terms, intellectual property. It, it used to just be information. There are many organizations that will spend money on acquiring knowledge, not because they can exploit it for commercial gains, but because it is valuable to them to know stuff. And the classic example, as I've, I've often tried to explain this through, is Reuters. If you think, we can't use places like GCHQ and anyone won't let us. If you think about Reuters, how much data do you suppose they gather on a daily basis globally? Good Lord, petabytes. Okay. It, it's just an astonishing amount of data. In fact, it's so much they don't even know what they've got. Yeah. No, they really don't. They just don't know what they've got. They don't know what they know. And do you know what? It doesn't matter. Why not? They control it when they... Well, because they control it and interrogate it. When they want to build a backstory on the breaking news as to why a tsunami's wiped out Southeast Asia, it's, well, because the fishermen are taking the batteries out of the boys in the, boat, in, in, in the tsunami detectors out at sea six months ago. They know that six months ago those were taken out of the boys because it's there in their data bank somewhere. But that's a commercial exploitation. Why do they do it strategically? I suppose when you have so much data even wide, you have a better outcome in terms of understanding the impact of change? They, they certainly can do that. And, and again, it's a question you want to exploit it for. But there's something even more deeper rooted here. Even though they don't know what they know, what do we know? They're trusted. They know. Well, they know. If you need to know something, go to Reuters, because they know the answer. They might charge you for getting it, but that's, that's a really strong position to be in in their marketplace. And it's what they is what you said earlier. It's what they do. It's in their DNA. Exactly. They just do it almost without thinking about it. It is without thinking about it because their strategic position is Reuters knows everything real time. Yeah. That's just a strategic stance. And to them, it is worth investing a huge amount of money and effort in doing that to maintain that position. Because if CNN or, or any other news outlet gets the jump on them on that, yeah. game's over. So, so those are our eight sources of benefits. And I'm really chewing up time here and not making much progress. Are we okay? I've got a nod, so I'll, I'll, keep, I'll, I'll bang on in this vein. Um, just a, a quick chat about this um, idea of corporate value. And, and apologies to my non-accountancy friends here. This is a completely notional and fictitious graph here. What I'm trying to represent with the black horizontal line is a level of value. That is, companies, broadly speaking, trot along at a, a static level of value. I mean, the job of the job of management and, and the directorship are to try and drive that level of value up. And the no, job of the competitors in the exchequer. I disagree with that. Okay. The job of directors now in large corporations, I'm not talking about small ones that actually have to feed themselves, in the massive corporations, FTSE 100, the job is to survive. That's it. Yes. It's not strategy, it's nothing else, it's survival. <laughs> Let's just maintain it. I've survived for three or five years, that's it. I've sorted out my grandkids, I'm out of here. So okay. Okay. Any jaundice exhibited in this room is not necessarily shared by the panel, but I know. <laughs> So that's what I see. I'm not going to take issue, but at the same time, the textbooks would have it that the job of management is to try and drive this line up, right. and the job of competition and the exchequer is to try and drag it down. And for most organisations, it more or less trolls along on a static basis, given the vagaries of markets. So it's a static position. If we achieve benefits in the way in which I've discussed them thus far today, this is what happens. You add value to the organization. That black line trends up. And this is the this benefit slide that should have taken us five minutes and has taken us an hour and a bit to get to. <laughs> so my apologies for, for right. meeting your expectations. That, of course, is a compelling reason for running change to achieve benefit, to make the organization physically better off, whether strategically or financially. And, and we should be very clear about which we're going for and how much of it we're going for when we're putting forward a business case. Of course, there is another compelling reason, which is you want to stop dropping off the edge of the cliff. And this is the disbenefits debate. It is worth spending money not to be prosecuted. It is worth spending money to ensure that the systems you have will continue to function safely, but it won't make you additional value. It can just stop value hemorrhaging away. The downside is it also has an associated cost. You must spend money on making the change to avoid falling off the cliff. So if, if we take that simple analogy a little bit further, there's a dangerous cliff, we will put a fence along the edge of that dangerous cliff. 
<laughs> Having just been told I'm okay to go on, I've just said I'm on slide three of 13, held up in front You're allowed to accelerate. <laughs> so, in the spirit of acceleration, listen fast. Um, it's the, the whole idea of avoiding loss is valuable to organisations. Don't confuse valuable with value adding. And if a sponsor is aggressively saying, we are doing this because we don't want to face this consequence, this is risk avoidance, the rules outlined by my colleague at the front here of we should do it at the lowest possible cost, abide. If you're on a red line project on this, you spend as little as you can. And as soon as you're sure you've avoided the risk, crack on with looking for some green line stuff to deliver. Okay. At the heart of all of this, and this is really a central tenet of this evening, so um, here we come on, on slide four, is, is thinking about organisational change and how benefits actually come around. Now, I hope I've given the impression I'm a little bit dogmatic and a little bit insistent on the categorisation and classification of benefits. It really is important. I don't think sponsorship or management or the project delivery teams or the users should be allowed wriggle room when we're spending significant amounts of corporate capital on, on projects to get off the hook by not being accountable to deliver what they're expected to in terms of outcomes and benefits. So the start of the journey from my perspective for any change initiative is not what should we build. The, the, the start of any change initiative is what is the problem or opportunity that we are aiming to address? Is it goods lost in transit? Or is it the fact that Apple have just launched an iPhone? What's the problem that we're here to address? And, and as soon as you've asked that question, the corollary question must be, well, what's it worth to address that problem? What's the return on addressing the problem? Because if there isn't a return on addressing the problem, guess what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to spend a cent addressing it. I'm not going to spend any effort or energy on, on working out how to do it. I'm just going to ignore it. So as soon as you've identified a problem or opportunity, the question is to say, what is the value? What is the benefit of addressing that problem or opportunity? And, and that's the start of the dialogue, not the end. It's not something we invent halfway through delivery. We don't say we've got this marvelous widget. How can we now exploit it to make some money? What we say is, how do we make some money or how do we achieve some strategic benefit? And, and how do we get to that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? Because until you've got some agreement about that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, it's not worth starting. I'll pause to have some objection there, but really, it, this, this to me is absolutely central. And it's so badly missed by, by many people. In fact, that, that very project on GLIT, um, I was able to predict quite accurately and correctly that the handheld barcode scanning system would not address GLIT. And I was thrown out of the building for security for that projection, which was you know, fair enough, because I was a cocky young man back in the day. Now they into a cocky old man, but there we are. The, the, the thing is that if you aren't absolutely clear on what value you're after, you can't structure a change that will achieve it. Now, I, I feel a bit of a fraud in, not a fraud, I, I feel I'm, I'm perhaps preaching to the wrong audience, because as the British Computer Society, you're providing the solutions to problems not directly providing the value from resolving the problem, but providing the solution that resolves the problem. There are a couple of slips between town up and lip with this thing. But the first thing to sort out on all occasions is what is the value? What is the benefit of the change? What's the value sought? And that value must align or be set by the strategy of the organisation, particularly if it's an intangible benefit. The financial benefit, well, as long as it's a commercial organisation, we're probably happy to go with financial benefits as long as they significantly outweigh the cost and risk of achieving them. Um, for non-commercial uh, non companies, charities and so forth, you've got to be clear on the strategic benefit before you can start. And, and for that, you resort back to the strategy. So there's the benefits position. But the question that's so badly addressed is how do benefits actually arrive? How do we change from one value position to another value position? And, and the link that is so often missed is the link of impacts. Now, impacts, and the synonyms are outcomes or results, are changes in behaviour. <laughs> People now ditch their razors and they ditch their um, old knuckers and they start picking up Apple iPhones and start making calls on them and starting to exploit the functionality of those things. Those are impacts. Those are changes in behaviour. 
And if those impacts don't occur, if people don't actually start buying and using iPhones and saying how valuable, how helpful to be able to surf the internet on my telephone, then we can't get the benefits. But impacts are hard to identify and define in many instances, and potentially even harder to achieve. How do you actually achieve changes? Well, that's the question. How do you actually get impacts? That's not rhetorical. I'm waiting for an answer. To generate outputs. Right. You have to generate a set of products, outputs, physical entities. You have to alter the environment in some way. And, and we'll stick with the iPhone because I've set off on that tangent. And clearly the first thing we need is an iPhone. Is that sufficient? Will Steve Jobs standing up in front of a conference holding up a weird piece of technology saying, this is the future, guys, make the difference? No, you've got to give it to people to use. You've got to sell it to people. Now, how are you going to do that? It's great maps. Right? It's great maps. You're going to have to have uh, uh, quite a few things sitting on the telephone to make it useful to the user. Right. But what's going to provoke a user to actually buy it and exploit it and try it? You the market to give some away, I mean, you? You might give story. some away. I, I, I have trouble counting the things that Steve gave anything away. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got to demonstrate it, though, somehow. Yes. Right. You're going to have to market it in some way. You're going to have to convince people that it is a worthwhile investment. It is a probably expensive piece of technology. So just as important, if not more important than the kit and its functionality, is the marketing that surrounds it. Now, if, if we haven't got a marketing campaign that is credible to the potential users, it doesn't matter how good the piece of technology is, it won't sell. And if it isn't sold to those users, they can't exploit it. So you don't get the impact. You don't get a surge of market demand. So which is more important, the handset or the marketing product? Marketing. marketing. Yeah, and in fact, it turns out the first version of the handset is pretty much useless. Its battery lasts two and a half minutes, and it doesn't do half the things that the current iPhone would do. But it's sufficiently distinct and different to drive the change in behavior where people start to expect surfing the internet on their telephone. And that's the outcome that Steve's after, people not seeing the telephone as a communication device so much as a portable handheld computer. And once they start to buy into that, which is down to marketing, not down to technology, then you start to get the change in behavior in the marketplace. These impacts are the real trick. And the identification of the correct set of products to achieve that trick is the key to effective project right. management. You've got to get the users not only to recognize that the fundamental primary piece of kit, the telephone, must, must be in their hands, but you've got to market that and sell it and support it in such a way that they can't avoid getting it. And what that's marketing hype about early adopters and technology and making it look sexy and whatever else, they're selling the image and the brand far more than they're selling the piece of technology itself because they're confidently expecting to supersede that piece of technology within six months anyway. I think two is going to be out before you can blink. So this, this is the key to real benefits realisation. Being able to describe this map and get the correct and sufficient product to achieve the necessary impact. But you don't do it in that order. Temporarily, you deliver it in that order. You can't get any impacts until the products have arrived, but you plan it and conceptualize it in this order. Work out what the value you're after is first, and then what's got to change to achieve that value, and then infer the products. Now in CITI, we call this imaginatively bit mapping, benefits impacts products. More enlightened clients, it's bid mapping, just substitute deliverables for products. Um, but but that's what we're doing. And it's it's what so many change initiatives miss. When should you do this? At the beginning. Then, right at the start of initiation. The same as requirements engineering. It, it's a slight stretch in many people's minds, but you're I think you're on a really good horse there if you back that one. Because what you're actually saying, it, it, Oh I'm going to get shown a, a five out of 13 slide in a second. It's, a lot of people seem to mistake requirements for specifications. Mm. Uh, yeah, people say I've got a requirement for a handset. No, you haven't. You've got a requirement to be able to communicate with people. 
a handset's not a requirement, it's it's a solution to a requirement. I if you that's an app, by the way, that is a massive, massive problem. That is the biggest problem we have with customers. Right. They I can tell you a course called getting the requirements right. They don't know what they want, but they try so instead of telling you what the business problem they're trying to solve is so we could solve it for them, they tell you what IT they want, what digital yeah. services they want. Yes. And they don't actually know because they're not up to date. Neither am I, by the way. This is exactly the problem that the COO, it wasn't actually the COO, but we'll stick with it because you used a title. It's exactly the problem the COO faced and the corporate retailer uh, with the glit. They yeah. didn't know what the problem was. They didn't know how much was theft, how much was human process error and laziness, how much was accounting error. They just knew that if they had a handheld barcode scanning system, they could count the products and they'd be okay, which was... I mustn't use that word in public. It was fallacious. It's not the root cause, is it? <laughs> it wasn't the root cause, quite so. So, I mean, so quite seriously, this picture is the key to real benefits realization. Having the discussion with the sponsoring and the user community during initiation about what's got to change in their world to get the value out of resolving the problem is really where it is. But this is one of the hardest conversations to have. Humans are inherently solution orientated. You know, we're genetically programmed to think first and foremost about the solution. Thank you very much indeed. And, and you know, anthropologists hoodwink us, don't they? they? There are two responses to a threat condition. What are they? Fight or flight. Fight or flight. Absolutely. Have you ever heard of fight, flight, or a good old dose of analysis? <laughs> is that the like a yellow tiger advancing on me. That saber tooth is getting closer all the time. It's going to hurt. I wonder whether it's hungry or angry. I don't really know. Let's analyze that problem a little. Oh, and it would be a very shallow gene pool, wouldn't it? So we're genetically programmed to go for a solution. Keeping the, the requirements, the problem space, and the value of the problem space front and center is a real art. And I can do far more than a couple of hours on that. So I'm going to park that for the moment. It's a couple of minutes instead, yes. David's, David's <laughs> <looking at this. laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got some slides to rattle through, apparently. I was enjoying this so much. Um, so here we go. The real key sitting at the middle of that model are impacts. Um, and, and impacts are changed behaviours. Yeah? It, 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 people tend to think, um, we've, we've, um, we've commissioned a system. That's changed the world. You know, we didn't have that system there before. We've got that system there now. And, and so we've achieved an impact. We've got the capability to process more data. That is absolutely value free. Why? There is no value in being able to process more data. You have to know why you're doing it. Yeah. Well, no, no, there could be a compelling reason to process more data, but there is no value in being able to process more data. Unless you use it. Unless you use it, unless you process more data. It's not the potential to do something that matters. It's that something is actually done. I don't care how shiny the system is and how much data it can process. If it isn't used, it can't have <laughs> the value. So it is about actually provoking the changed behavior. That's why I was insisting Steve has not only got to have a really swept up piece of technology, he's got to have a really cracking marketing product as well sells this to people such that they buy into it and exploit it and use it because if you don't get the changed behavior you don't get the benefits okay so a changed behavior is literally that isn't it the person was walking they are now running we've given them all the necessary kit a pair of running shoes sexy shorts and and, and sports bras and whatever else we've needed it by way of kits to get them running tiger You've got to provide the tiger as well, because if there isn't something that actually makes them run, thank you very much indeed, Nigel, that was brilliant. <laughs> if there isn't something that actually makes them use those running shorts and shoes, then, then we don't get the benefit of improved health or for whatever reason they want it to run. So the killer questions are how do you actually achieve it? And that does require wider questioning than what's the fundamental piece of kit. Just giving somebody some running shoes won't make them run. Four numbers. You've got to give them some education, some change of mindset, some other products that will persuade them that using those running shoes is going to be valuable to them, for them to actually alter their behaviour. And, and that's the question that we really ought to focus on if we're going to take the, the, the title of this 
uh, discussion seriously. Making benefits real is about ensuring we know how we're going to achieve the change behaviours that will give rise to benefits. And that is a discussion with the necessary stakeholders, the users, and the sponsoring community. It's not something that the IT crowd can do in its own uh, in designing systems. You, know, you will have to design the systems that provide those outcomes, but, but it's not about the system. It's about the outcome. The system is always an only an enabler. How do you know you've achieved them is another interesting question. I mean, quite easy to observe somebody running from a tiger. That seems to be doing the trick or not, in which case it becomes good sport. But um, what we're really interested in is being able to know we've achieved the necessary changes where it's not so obvious. You know? um, and, and, and what we've got to do for that is we've got to establish key performance indicators. Yes. And, and the uptake of <laughs> is probably the key performance indicator that Steve Jobs is looking for. But actually, <laughs> selling, the, selling the handsets is a, a pretty poor key performance indicator. Why? It doesn't matter the usage. Not use it. right. It's about their usage. How much time are they now spending surfing the web as opposed to making telephone calls with the app they bought? Because that's where I really want them. This is what my competitors can't do. They can't offer you web surfing off their handsets. I mean, Nokia have got some fairly sophisticated kit knocking about back then, but it didn't surf the web. So I need to see my KPI in terms of the change behaviors from my customer base as an increase in access to, to IP domains or whatever else it is that, that he's yeah. using to measure the, the use of the kit. So key performance indicators are important, and you must be able to associate a key performance indicator with your primary impacts. And that must be something that you can readily, comparatively easily measure, probably cheaply. The other killer question is, how do you sustain it? You can't have a flash in the pan if you want to achieve long-term benefits. You know, fad diets don't work. People revert to types. You can get temporary changes in the behavior, but getting people to change their lifestyle and diet and exercise habits longer term is a much tougher trick to pull off. So always, again, worth discussing with the users. How do you avoid reversionary behavior? I mean, you can, luckily, in many situations, just remove the environment from them decommission systems or applications and remove them from, from use altogether. But that can be quite draconian and can have significant legacy benefits. So um, you need to worry about the cost of the approaches you use. But if you can't make it endure, you don't get lasting benefits. So are we all happy back in the cheap seats? <laughs> I know he's asking questions, I'm assuming so then. Or well, they just left. Um, and, and the key to this, and I'm going to rattle through this because I think we've, we've probably discussed it, we will run out of time, is, is a process called bid mapping or BIP mapping, I suggested. And, and it'll turn at the end of the day into a linear model, but it's quite hard to generate this. So the technique of BIP mapping, benefit impact product mapping, is you decide what benefit you're after. And, and we helped a small Caribbean island with this problem. They made a lot of revenue out of cruise liners parking in the harbour and, and dropping unsuspecting expecting American tourists on this Caribbean paradise um, and, and wanted to increase the amount of money they made with that. So they thought they'd run a, a harbour improvement project. And they claimed they were going to increase tourist traffic. Is that a benefit? Hmm. Mm -hmm. well, they spend. Right. It is an impact. Mm -hmm. yeah? It is a change in behaviour. More tourist footfall on the island mm -hmm. is, is an impact. It's, it's that middle bubble. What's the benefit of more tourist footfall? It's if they spend more. If they spend, then... And they come back more often. So you're looking for new and additional income. There could be a counter effect of wearing out the environment. There could well be. And we've got to look at the costs in the round. It's not just the cost of dredging and extending the harbour and the infrastructure supporting the harbour, but the cost, as you say, of environmental impact and wear and tear on the infrastructure has to be factored in as well to a, a significant investment by building the harbour. Absolutely. So what I really admire is the fact that you've just challenged a benefit position here. This is clearly a positive impact as far as the island is concerned, but it isn't yet a benefit. And we're not clear what the benefit is. Is the strategy to increase tourist footfall or is it, are we simply grubbing for additional cash or are we trying to achieve both? And we've got to agree the extent to which either or both are being sought by the project before we can justify the cost of hammering the environment and building the infrastructure. 
So the benefits must be determined first, in part because they will determine the cost you prepare to invest in a project. Okay. So having determined what benefit categories they were seeking and the volume of those, they nonetheless insisted, and correctly so, that this is the primary impact they were after. And, and how do we actually go about doing that? So it's best to start one of these bitmaps with a sort of mind mapping approach rather than trying to create a linear logic model. The linear logic model is quite hard to do. So I discourage you from trying it as a first step. First step is to do a mind mapping approach. And so you simply put the primary significant change in behavior, the primary impact in the middle of the map. And in this case, it's an additional tourist footfall. How do you then go about increasing additional tourist footfall is the question you ask. And the answer to the first part of that is, well, we'll make it simpler and easier to access Georgetown, because that's where they parked the boats in this particular Caribbean island. So we'll make it easier. But that's not enough. Just making it easy and simple to access the town. We want to make the town more attractive itself. We want to make it a more attractive destination. So you look at it and think, I really must get off the cruise liner. I'm going to book my daiquiri down and get onto that uh, tender and chug off over to the island rather than sit admiring it from afar. So it's going to be a more attractive destination. And we also want to improve the tourist experience. So they start speaking about it to their friends who are also buying tours of the Caribbean. So you must stop in Georgetown. It's great. So not only must they be able to get to Georgetown easily, it must be attractive when they get there and they must enjoy the experience of being within it. And that means we also need to generate more appealing marketing of the attraction, make sure that people get the word and, and then indeed do decide to disembark their luxurious cruise liner. Having <coughs> what you are happy with as a first tier of impacts, move on to a second tier of impacts. So how would you make it simpler and easier to access Georgetown? We just provide more docking opportunities. We can only fit two cruise liners in the harbour as it stands, but if we dredge it out and broaden it a bit, we can probably get three or four cruise liners in. That'll improve access. So that gives us more docking opportunities. We can get more boats in. We could reduce the transit times. It takes about 15 minutes to get off the boat onto the tender, the tender to chug across the harbour and disembark you at the harbour side. And so if we can speed that up, we can get more throughput. So let's let's uh, have shorter transit times. One of the bottlenecks is when they get to the harbour side, the good old immigration is standing there issuing forms for them to fill in. And there's a great big bottleneck and people are queuing. So actually, we need reduced bureaucracy at the harbour side. We can either move it onto the boat or we can ditch it all together or we can put it on the web or whatever we do. I don't care how we achieve it. We've got to cut down our bureaucracy and, and we can improve the frequency at which this happens. Yeah. Have more tender people bugging out and so on. And you can obviously run this type of logic right around the whole model. Um, simply commercial transactions would make it a more attractive destination, so would simpler entry processes, um, improving the tourist experience by making sure the environment is kept clean and tidy. This particular island is inhabited by a lot of chickens that get run over on the roads. They make a hell of a mess. So let's sweep up the chickens more regularly. That would make it a more attractive environment. And so on. OK. And, and you can see that you can't <laughs> blow this map. And if you actually achieve all of these outcomes, the net result must be that you increase your additional tourist footfall. And if you've done it properly and your logic circuits are right and you've got the supporting products, they'll spend their additional tourist dollar with you and you will get additional income. So, so this is the wisdom of it. And this is how you go about building such a thing. It's worth saying that when you first do it, you will find you build quite a bit of repetition into this stuff because certain impacts are common to more than one sub-impact. So, for example, you can see that reduced bureaucracy is essentially much the same thing as a simpler entry process. Right. And that uh, improved match between supply and demand is exactly the same as an improved match between supply and demand. It supports both a more attractive destination and an improved tourist exhibition uh, experience. And that simple commercial transactions are essentially a, a, a synonym for easier to do business with, payments, languages, etc. So when you start to identify these um, overlaps, you can you can cheerfully rule out those ones, because you know that if you're going to achieve the other ones, you can in effect achieve them by default. It will rationalize and simplify your map and cause you to focus on the more important topics as far as you're concerned. And, and in fact, we can get away because all of the sub impacts of a more attractive destination are met by the other three impacts. We can do away with more attractive destination. We get it by default. <coughs> Ultimately, you will chain this into a linear model where you can clearly articulate the relationships between these things. So the additional tourist footfall has three primary impacts, simply an easy access to the town, improved tourist experience, and better marketing, more improved marketing. Art, art. 
the other the sanitization, the costs of the world. Ah, <laughs> we, we did. The benefits case must outweigh the cost. Okay. This is, this is the fundamental equation, and we're going to come on to the business case if we have time in a few moments, but we must outweigh the cost or it's not worth doing it. But do you start by working out the cost or do you start by working out the benefit? And this isn't a rhetorical question. The benefit? Always, always start with benefit. Because if you can't get enough benefit, what can you cheerfully not do? Unless you work in procurement, in which case you start with the cost. <laughs> <laughs> which is back to the entire problem. Here comes, here comes to the next corner again. I'm very happy to... <laughs> You've got, you, you know, again, this is, I think one of the values of these sorts of discussions is it's, if you start to translate, you know, with a cynical overview, what happens in reality against what should happen. We yeah. all know that before you examine whether you can do something, you've got to work out whether it's worth doing it in the first instance anyway. Yes. But so many people start off with, I need a handheld barcode scanning system. Can I afford one? Not, how much money do I need to save? And what would I have to change to save that money? Because I'll tell you what, it's never going to be a handheld barcode scanning system. That won't stop larceny at all. You know, you're going to have to change your recruitment policies or up your security systems if you want to prevent larceny. But a handheld barcode system won't do it. Where we go wrong so often, and I'm, you know, I know I'm shooting fish in a barrel, but I'm also running out of time. So, so I'm going to just press blithely on. Uh, so here are our three primary level impacts. The secondary level impact straight from our map are like that. And to each of these, we must be able to attach a key performance indicator. Hmm. Now, you're not going to invent, or I don't want you to invent, please, a cottage industry and key performance indicator measurement. It is ridiculous. You'll spend more in trying to monitor the benefits than the benefits would confer to you. But you should be able to identify the key performance indicators, the ones that really matter to the benefits. And you ought to be able to line those with simple proxy measures. Generally, they're usually recorded automatically in most organisations. For example, the government of this particular island do keep an assiduous record of how many people come through their doors. They do know how many people arrive, so they know what the tourist footfall is. That's not an ancillary or extra measurement. They've got to spend no further money from their already existing processes. They've just got to map the delta between what they have and what they get once they've done the improvements. And this is the, the watchword for, for our making benefits real. Don't make them an additional cottage industry. Identify them in such a way that you can easily align your surrogate or proxy measures, your APIs for the outcomes with your existing MI as far as you reasonably can, because we don't want a separate cottage industry. The PMO would thank you for the additional work, I'm quite sure, but it's not really their job. And there you are, typical typical uh, KPIs against each of those impacts would look something like that. And and you know, as David's already alluded to, the slides will be out with you. So if you want to if you want to keep a note of these, you can. Um obviously products sit at the heart of this, and this is what projects generate, but uh, I don't want to spend too long dwelling on products. Products are in all instances, they have one defining characteristic in common, which is enablers. Say again? They're enablers. They are definitely enablers, but they, that, that, that is not the characteristic they have in common. Although well, it is. They have two characteristics in common. <laughs> <laughs> Romans have gone first. Yeah, straight Romans. <laughs> Products are invariably physical entities. They are always things. They are kit. That doesn't mean they're necessarily... Um, uh, they can be organic. You know, humans are products. And the synonyms <laughs> for them are they are... They are outputs or deliverables, but they always have a tangible physical entity to them. They actually create the environment that forces and hosts the impacts. Okay, they're therefore mandatory enablers. So, so there's your enabler word, thank you very much, in the sense that they're the things that change initiatives must create to bring about the impacts. Impacts don't just miraculously arise, they are the result of products. And it's products and products that we focus on as, as project and delivery managers. Um, but if those products don't confer the outcomes, we're, we're on a fool's errand. And, and so here's a, a meaningless slide of, of uh, a product. How many products can we see in this picture? Um, 
think it's one. <coughs> one Three. maybe nine. Well, I'd say at least nine. Nine <laughs> products here. How many of those are necessary? <laughs> well, it depends what impact you're trying to generate, doesn't it? Don't get seduced by the products, get seduced by the impacts. What of those products do we actually need? But there are nine there. There's a cup of saucer, some fluid in the cup, which is coffee. Um, there's some black object I can't identify above the coffee cup. There's two books. There's a pen, there's a keypad, and this is importantly a desk. And there's your nine products. Which are the necessary ones? Coffee. Coffee and agenda. Depends what impact you're after, doesn't it? <laughs> if your impact is staying awake, coffee will do the whole lot. Your general will send you to sleep, I promise. So, <laughs> so you know. That's why you need them both. <laughs> do moderate your products from the impact. Here we are. Um, some products are there because they confer control. And if you can achieve autonomous control in many systems, switchboards are a perfectly good example of that. It is cheaper than using human interfaces to achieve the impacts you want to achieve. It's also more <laughs> powerful than using humans to achieve the impacts that you want to achieve. So you have to think about what sorts of products I need to achieve the impacts. Can I can I make autonomous products? Um, and do would they be attractive and, and usable? Um, and and you need to be careful about your specifications. You know, here's a couple of chairs you might use for work. Uh, they have a significant price differential. They also have different functional requirements about them. And, and if you give the wrong person the wrong chair, they're going to get really upset, especially when it comes to pulling that black and yellow handle. You get the idea. Not all products are the same because even similarly described products provide different functionality. And it is the functionality that enables the impact. So uh, don't go giving a pilot chair A, obviously. They can't get out of that. Um, We've done enough discussing of of, uh, of 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 iPhones for the evening, but um, you know, products are really useful from the perspective not only of they confer the impact, but they're a valuable management tool. You can count progress against products. You cannot count progress against activities. In fact, if you think about it, activities are only there to generate products. All processes have an output. All processes therefore generating products and, and focusing your management control on the product and physical entity is is far more effective than uh, trying to focus on the task of building a wall okay. because you can only assess its progress by the number of bricks that have been laid the other thing on this slide that i just want to spend a few moments mulling over is, is the happy smiling chap in, in in the middle of the screen do remember products are not necessarily inert these these like people and in fact one of the key products in most change initiatives are the users themselves they've got to be educated to change their behavior you know, they've got to be seduced or lectured or induced to, to do what you need them to do if you're going to achieve the impacts now again it's very easy for an it department to become fixated with the kit more so than the user and if the user doesn't deploy the kit in the way it's intended to be deployed we don't get any impacts, therefore no benefits. And um, I'm sure I don't have to go on about that. <laughs> I can do if you want me to, but I won't, because I'll time out before I do. So, um, very important. The, the other aspect of this, which we will have a brief flirt with, because I'm coming for a clear of time, um, is, is benefits in the business case. And um, I, I, I've been exposed to the five case model and, and um, that's far too complex for a bear of little brain like me. I, uh, the business case is essentially about the benefits. What is the reward for addressing a problem we face? Okay. And once you know what the reward is, you can hazard a guess at how much cost you'd be prepared to court to achieve that reward. Depends what the payback ratios your organisation is looking for, but given a £5 million pool of benefits, how much would we actually spend on trying to secure that? Because that's going to be your project budget. It's not worth spending more than that amount of cash on securing that level of benefit. So cost-benefit analysis is important, but that starts with working out what the benefits are and then inferring a cost, not knowing that that's the correct sum to deliver the project in. It's just that's the upper limit on what you would spend on the project. If you can't get a solution for less than that cost, forget it. It's not going to happen. You're all comfy with that. Prove your real Marvelous. Good. Um, but of course, the accountants can take you through cost benefit analysis to the cows come home. There is a component missing, which is what? What's wrong with a cost benefit analysis? In project A, the cost of £2 million, 
Unit project B would have cost of four million pounds. Project A with benefits of eight million pounds. And here's project B with benefits of 16 million pounds. They've got the same payback ratios and profiles and um and they're mutually exclusive. You can only do one or the other. Which one will you go for? Project A or project B? Depends on a risk. And it's entirely on the risk, doesn't it? It really does. If I said you know, Project A's got a 48% chance of winning out, and Project B's got a 16% chance of winning out, which one do we go for now? A. You're going to bet on a less than 50% probability Sorry. of success. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but uh, the one other thing we didn't say was affordability as well, of course. Risk well, we can, we can well, afford, afford either. Yeah, we can afford either. But I've said, Project A's got a 48% probability of success. And Project B's got a 16% probability of success. 16% probability of success. Sorry? Did you say 60 or 60? Yeah, I'm saying that we, we've done an assessment. Oh, we believe the risk to each of these means that there's a 48% chance of success for Project A and a 16% chance of success for Project B. A. No, I'll, I'll have another look. I'll have another look at A and see. If oh no, under fifty percent. Don't waste one. your money on those odds. Go and find Project C or anything else that's not going to throw away millions of pounds. But it has the capital. This is why benefits are really important, guys. If you don't really believe you can get them, don't try. Okay. That's how you make them real by betting on horses that are going to win, not betting on horses that are going to fall at the fifth fence. It does make sense, doesn't it? Yeah. I can be very brave <laughs> in a lecture room on a Tuesday evening. <laughs> it makes sense. It's not what happens, is it? It makes sense, but at the same time, every every investment requires a risk. Of course, yes. So, so if you can say this has got a seventy-three percent chance of success, <laughs> this has got a sixty-one percent chance of success. Now, I'm happy to invest probably in either. But I think I'd lean towards B. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, there's a risk in an investment, but you've got to understand the reward that makes the risk worthwhile before you yes, decide when you do it. it. Not the cost mm -hmm. and the risk. You didn't yeah. take time into account either, because if I can do two of Project A, mm -hmm. I might not bother with B in the same timeline. So say B is going to take 30 months and A is taking yeah. 12, I, I, I'd go for two A's if I could, thought I could fit them in. Yes, absolutely. I, and, and we could overwork my simple analogy here that I'm just simply demonstrating the importance of a business case because there are two audiences for a business case. But this is important. I mean, I said I couldn't understand the five case model because it's got five bits and three is really too much. If you look at this, you, you can make it a two part thing, can't you? What we've got north of that red dotted line is the desirability. How how good is it for us? How much do we want it? Are we actually gagging for this change? Will we really enjoy it when we get it? And south of the line, you're looking at the doability. Can we afford it? And will we be prepared to run the risk? And the, the important message that I want you to take away from this evening is you always, always work out the desirability before the board. The desirability provides a null answer. You save a lot of time, effort and grief not looking at the doability. And yet so many people say, oh, I'd like to do this. How much would it cost? The answer is not how much would it cost? It's how much will it make? And how confident you are it will make it. Because that, that risk is not just the risks to the cost and the delivery of the project. It's also the risks to the attainment of the benefits. Those should be assessed first. And there are two audiences for this, of course. You know, desirability, the benefits position, appeals to two discrete audiences. The first is the sponsor. It is the motivation for the project. Why is it worth doing this thing? But the other is the investment board in the organisation. It's how many project A's and project B's are on the slates. And we've got to choose the right ones to stick our investment funds into. It's a competitive market. There are always more ways of spending your money than resources available. So given that we've got, uh, you know, a limited supply and a massive demand, you've got to sort the two out. And that's a competitive environment. And the benefits and business case are the way of sorting out that debate. And, and we are playing to both audiences. I'm also down to the last five minutes. So I just want to go to a sort of few concluding remarks. Um, look, I, I hope you've brought into the elegance of the argument, as it were. You start making benefits real by focusing on the benefits first and foremost. 
not by making them an afterthought to somebody's madcap scheme to introduce a new piece of kit. Yeah? That means we're clear on what the problem with the opportunity is, and we get concord agreement about the value of resolving that problem. Yeah, but you know, that one too will depend on your passion, interest. Yes. And, and I think you're absolutely right. More crucially, it will depend on the passion and the interest of the sponsor and the user. And if they don't buy into it, you're not getting it. Uh, I say you're not getting it. I mean, the organization's not getting it. If your sponsor is not invested in the benefits position, and if they can't convince or cajole yeah. the users into buying into that benefits position and make it a reality in people's minds before you start doing the development work, you're on a hiding to nothing. So benefits realization, making benefits real starts with the benefits. From the benefits, it moves into and sharing the understanding of those benefits, which might be about the additional value, or they might be about the risk avoided, the disbenefits we're seeking to avoid, and just change the strategy of the project. But you've got to agreement on that. And agreed measures of attainment, so they're not a work of fiction. Yeah. If you can't get the stakeholders bought into that, you're going nowhere. You really aren't. And, and I'll tell you what, if you're going nowhere, stop investing effort in it. That's just to sit down and twiddle your thumbs. I'm that proactive. <laughs> Once you know what the benefits are, look for the impact. Okay? Straightforward stuff. It is about actual change of behavior, not the capacity to change behavior, not the capability. We've all got the capability of running 100 meters, and it would be an interesting exercise for many of us. We'd be painfully challenged, but we could do it. How many of us are actually going to run 100 meters? Well, we're just not, are we? Not because we haven't got the capability, we just haven't got the motivation or desire or need. Yeah. So, so we won't. Impacts are about achieving the change. That's what we really are. We make benefits real by achieving the change of behaviour. And as already stressed, consistency in those changes is crucial. We don't want fad diets. We want permanent changes to lifestyles. Else you don't get sustained and enduring benefits. Now, there may be situations where you are looking for transitory benefits. All benefits have a profile. But some of them are transitory. You're not going to make a huge killing out of selling Kate and Will's wedding mugs nowadays. But, you know, a decade ago, you could make a little bit of money out of it. Fifteen years ago, you'd make a fortune out of it. So you don't have to make all behaviour persistent, but it needs to be consistent with the time in which you expect to harvest the benefits. Benefits profiling is perhaps a, a subject for another day. And the KPIs are critical. You've agreed measures during the benefits discussion. You've actually got to execute those measures and demonstrate you've attained them in the real world thereafter. And then products, okay? You've got to liaise with the change agents, the people who are actually going to exhibit the change behaviours, the users in most common parlance, um, because they're going to enact the impacts. And if they don't, you know, again, the benefits are just a work of fiction. So, you know, yes, I'm taking as a given the skill and experience that you can create the products, but, but that's the lesser part of the story. The big part of the story is the engagement of the users to accept and utilize the products in a useful way. And it's one of the reasons that, that, that I think so many people are advocates for Agile, because they take the user on the development journey so that they get buy-in. But that's not unique to Agile. You know, I remember in the early days of my, my consulting career, we, we did a lot of um, product development essentially on, on waterfall type approaches. And the fundamental rules set out by, by Pinto and Slevin as far back as the late 80s was, if you don't engage the user on the journey, you are whistling in the wind. It's Indeed. always been a valuable part of all product development life cycles, whether agile or waterfall, is engage the users. Because if you don't, you don't get a change, you don't get a benefit. Yeah, but that's the problem of the projects being impact upon now. They don't always bring people alive. It's either the business analyst is doing his own, the project manager, the scrum master, everybody is doing what they and at the point in time you discover that if the timeline is six months. If it's not taking, it's either they cancel the project or it's been extended. 
Again, uh, the, 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 the Agile Award for Project Product Development Lifecycle debate is one that we really haven't got time yeah. for tonight. Yeah. Much as I'd love to stand there and engage on that for the next couple of hours. I think I'd be, I'd, be on a, I'd be in a room on my own, so I'm not going <laughs> to do that. Okay? But, um, but it, 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 I, I, my last word on it is, if you don't engage the users, you're not getting any of this stuff. It's a complete fallacy to think you're going to get benefits if the users aren't bought. So by hook or by crook, and I don't care what titles you're applying to people, if you're in any way responsible for the discharge of a project and you don't uh, don't don't engage the users, stay on you. Simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> I think closing words, if you're planning benefits, you've really got to be clear on who the users are and what the purpose of the product actually is, and have you got all the necessary products to provide the appropriate packages? Now, I have to confess, I can't quite remember where the horse jumping a hurdle here. Who's the user in this case? The jockey? The pundits? The trainer? Or the horse? Horse. Well, who can say? It depends what benefits you're seeking. Hmm. Yeah. And to whom they are valuable. That'll, that'll start to moderate the performance. Be clear about the roles and what outcomes you're trying to achieve. So um, which you have to consider all the players. Really. You have to consider all the players, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, look, I've had an absolute blast. It's been a ripping time for me, so I hope you've learned that from it, but that's eight o'clock, so I'm done.